thigh. Take a deep breath in and breathe out. When you breathe in, your stomach is out. And when you breathe out, your stomach goes in. So keep breathing in and out. Joy, can you make sure the doors are closed, these, these windows? Now take attention to your tongue and the roof of your mouth and let's chant the sacred sound of Om. Take a deep breath in. Om. Take a deep breath in. we start Om this time, we'll make sure that we start the Om with the awareness that it's in the base of our stomach, okay? We are going to be starting Om one more time. We'll do one more set of three chants and then we'll start with the first drink, okay? So take a deep breath in. Om. One more time, breathe in. Om. Breathe in again. So a drink will be passed around to you. This drink has a combination of lemon juice, it's a warm drink, and tridoshic churna. It has mint leaves in it, fresh mint leaves, and it has an extra dose of turmeric, and it has black pepper, which is part of the tridoshic churna. The idea is to make sure that you eliminate any type of mucus that is in your system. Now, most people who just eat, when there is mucus in their system are not really assimilating their food because the mucus inhibits the process of assimilation. So it's a tad hot, so just be a little careful, but make sure you sip it. Okay. So this is a drink which is also got in it some kala namak. So kala namak is a black salt which has a lot of minerals. And I also put in some Himalayan rock salt, as in the pink Himalayan rock salt that you get. So when you put that salt into your stomach with a warming liquid, automatically all of your digestive enzymes start flowing. And when your digestive enzymes start flowing, you're basically preparing your body for the process of digestion. Okay, so I'm going to allow you guys a few minutes to just mindfully drink this beverage. And then I love art to talk. So, and then I'll tell them about spices so that I can, yeah. It's like a soup. It's like a soup. <laughs> well, the soup is really coming on very soon. Wasn't that hot for you, like temperature? No, I love it. I come from a place where I love it. I love it better. That's right. Egypt's very hot. That's true. 
<laughs> so the whole idea is mindfulness with your meal, right? Many a times what happens is that people don't really approach a meal with the mindfulness that it deserves. What we really need to understand is that we have one body and we are never going to be given another body. And the Shastras and Samskaras from India, the country that I come from, um, the Vedic heritage, it talks very importantly about this, right? So the whole beauty of an entire human form, the human body, is in the process of your digestion. It's the way that the fire in your digestive system is lit. Right? So now that we have the liquid in our system and it's cleansing our palate, we'll try Om just one more time. Okay? So keep your eyes closed. Breathe in. Om. So if you noticed, it was much easier to chant the Om because this Tridoshic Churna with the black pepper in it completely clears off the mu mucus in the sides of your throat as well as in your intestinal cavity and in the pit of your stomach. I'm going to spend a lot of time with questions. So if you have any questions, write them down so you don't forget the questions and you can still focus on the lecture, right? So I want all of you to do a very simple exercise. So keep your feet apart. Right? Stand up and keep your feet apart. Okay, put your hands in Namaste. And do a loud scream the way that you can the best, okay? Like the loudest scream that can ever come out of you right now. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, you know, what just came out of you right now, please sit down. What came out of you right now was not just a scream. Many people didn't want to scream because the Om takes you to a certain level of consciousness, correct? But what was really happening is when a person was able to scream, right? It automatically tells you about what is really going on with a certain aggressive force that lurks in the bottom of your backbone. This is a region which is called the muladhara, okay, or the root chakra or the base chakra. Many people approach a meal when they are angry, upset, physically hurt, emotionally hurt. Now the argument could be then I guess we can never eat. Right? Because most people are like, you know, having one of those emotions at every point of time. But what really happens to the human body is if you really want to get physical exhaustion out of your system, there is a certain beauty in screaming. A simple scream can actually remove physical exhaustion as well as mental irritation, which is exactly what kids do when they want to get their way, right? As adults, when we want to get out of our own way, the best thing to do is to scream, completely get it out. And I did this as an exercise in an old age home. You'd be surprised how loudly those people can sw yell. They're like louder than kids. Seriously. And I did this exercise also in a prison establishment where I was teaching them that vegetarian options are a good idea, much better than spam. And a beautiful thing about this is that when the sound came out of their system, the bad sound always comes from the back. The good sound always comes from your belly. The good food needs to go into your belly. Only then will bad stuff come out of your back. And that's the way we are, you know. It's always, you are not just what you eat, you're also what you don't poop. And that is the truth, right? It's all of your digestive toxins which are lurking in your body, which do this all the time. Now, when I was given this topic of sound, initially we were supposed to be in the other place, and then I think there was some problem, so our musicians didn't come. And we were supposed to do it from different cultures. 
But then I thought, let's just focus on India and do a lot of Indian spices. We do a lot of chanting, right, in our culture. So I'm going to pass this around. This is a set in prayer. And I'm going to go over it. So can you pass it around? All right. And what really happens is when you bless your food, when you learn to understand the meaning of your blessing, and it automatically increases the energetic value of your food. I think a lot of the world has focused its attention on the calorific value of food. We need to focus on three things when it comes to food. Where the ingredients are sourced from, the method of how things are prepared, and the third is after it is prepared, how the food is blessed. Remember that when your food is actually prepared, the person who is preparing it also needs to be in a fantastic mood because his or her energy is actually transferred into the food that they prepare. Now, a lot of people who sing in the shower not only have better voices, are very happy for the rest of their day. Similarly, people who sing while they cook, their food is not only tastier, the people that they feed the food to are happier. Now, that is such a simple concept, but it is also the home of very expensive research. I can't believe that people were really thinking about how many people sing in the kitchen. The truth is most people who hum a tune are happy to begin with. Because sound, which is happy, comes out of you when you're happy. Isn't that right? Now, sounds which are a little bit not so nice come out of you when you're not feeling that good. Now, I want to talk a little bit about our attitude towards meals, on our attitude towards food, and our attitude towards meal times. When are the real right times for you to eat? You should always break your fast, and that needs to be the largest meal of your day. So you really eat like a king or a queen. And around 8 o'clock in the morning seems okay. Lunch should be as close to noon as possible, because the sun is directly over the top of your head. And when the sun is directly over the top of your head, your metabolism and the digestive fire, or, or the agni, is at its highest. So you want to eat as close to 12 noon as possible. And your evening meal should be not after sunset. Try to eat within the parenthesis of within when there is still light in the sky. Okay? So I'm going to go over this prayer right now. And I know it could be a bit of a tongue twister, so I'm not going to do both the paragraphs. We'll just do the first one. First repeat, and then I will chant, and then you can jump into it. It's very easy. Annapurne. Sadha Purne. Shankara. Pranavallabe. Jnana. Vairagya. Siddhyartham. Bhiksham. Dehicha. Parvati. Okay. So the meaning is right there. Annapurne, she who is full of food. The goddess Parvati was the consort of Lord Shiva. Sadapurne, who is always full of resources, plentiful, abundant. Shankara, thus of Lord Shiva. Prana, which is the vital life force or the vital energy. Vallabe, the beloved. Jnana, knowledge. Vairagya, the attitude of renunciation. Siddhyartam, to fulfill the purpose of. Biksham, arms or food. Dehicha, give us. And Parvati, Namostate, you could do that too. All right, so we're going to chant this together. It's, I'll do that first and then I'll do it with you guys until you get the hang of it. Annapurne Sadapurne. Shankara Prana Vallabe. Jnana Vairagya Siddhyartham. Biksham Dehicha Parvati. Okay? Let's do it. You can look at it, of course. Annapurne Sadapurne. Shankara Prana Vallabe. Jnana Vairagya Siddhyartham. Biksham Dehicha Parvati. Annapurne Sadapurne. Shankara Prana Vallabe. Jnana Vairagya Siddhyartham. 
Biksham Dehicha Parvati. Very good. So the thing with this shlokam is that it is a blessing. It is a blessing that you can do to food. Now normally the act of eating food in a bowl is a very good idea because you're, when you put your palms together, it is like a bowl, right? It's not like a plate. So what happens, what is the difference between a bowl and a plate? If you really think about it, a bowl is more cozy. It is just like the palms of your hand. A plate is more flat. What you really want is thing which conforms. Look at your stomach. Your stomach is not flat. It's J-shaped. It's more like a bowl. So the receptacle of that food, which is outside, completely mirrors how that food goes inside and where it will go inside. All right? So eating in a bowl, much better idea. Please don't use plastic and melamine. I think everyone's spoken about that for years and years. Um, glass is a good option. Um, I'm a big fan of wood. I think wood or bamboo bowls are a very good thing to eat with. And um, can you get the bowls of soup for everybody? So we're going to serve you a very interesting soup today. That soup has a combination of tuar dal, which is a very proteinaceous dal from South Indian cuisine. It's otherwise called the pigeon pea. Um, it's used all over India, but in South India more. I have um, some cooked tomatoes in the broth, which is a really nice addition because cooked tomatoes release lycopene, which is very good for you know, anti-cancer health as well as cardiovascular health. It has turmeric in it. Um, I'm sure all of you are no strangers to turmeric. It's a fabulous antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. And turmeric, um, this particular turmeric, it comes from our um, sources in India, which has absolutely no additives. In fact, uh, Art was telling us something about, what were you saying about additives? A lot of people just don't know that there's all these additives in the turmeric you get here in the United States, and that you have a very pure source of I think it actually smells different. You know, somebody came and asked me this. I was just, you know, setting up, and there was this gentleman, he says, what is that smell? And I hadn't put out anything, right? I just had the turmeric. And it's just, you know, packed in little bags. And I said, I don't know, maybe it's turmeric. He says, turmeric can't be so fragrant, right? I said, but it is. And I've grown up with that turmeric my whole life, right? And so I said, extremely crazy. So he picked that up and he said, he smelled it and he says, give me six packets. And I said, why six packets? And he says, well, it's not just me. I'm going to make sure that my ex-wife gets one and my three children. And guess what? I'm going to keep one for my dog food. <laughs> he said, it's, if it's good for human beings, it's good for my dog. So the good thing with um, this turmeric is that it absolutely has no additives. I've seen it through the entire process. Uh, when it's harvested, we allow it to sun dry as opposed to force it to dry. And then we peel the skin off and powder it. It's a really, really good source of turmeric. So that turmeric is in there. And you should also remember turmeric is very good as a salve. So let's say you have a little cut or a bruise, you can put turmeric on it. Um, turmeric is very good um, in the prevention of Alzheimer's, you know, so especially when the plaque is created in the brain, uh, this turmeric helps remove it. So that's very good. All different types of cancers. I mean, um, the amount of studies done on mice, I mean, it's surprising the mice don't look yellow. So, of course, the very potent substance in the turmeric is curcumin. It's a very active substance, and it's very good for you. So, as, especially when you cook the turmeric, this kind of turmeric, it not only gives you a very nice flavor, it's very good for you med medically. And uh, it has some cumin in it, um, and cumin um, as in really nice shredded cumin, you know, uh, very, very nice powdered, and it's kind of roasted I um, put in, in there some ginger, uh, really fresh ginger root. And I also have put in there some mint leaves. And I topped it up with dried fenugreek leaves. Now, fenugreek, of course, everybody knows it from time immemorial. Okay, it's like, it's called methi in India. And, okay, your, your soups are here. I think you should give them some spoons rather than drink it. Yeah, some spoons would be good. Yeah. So... What really happens with methi? Methi is very well researched in the last 20 years for creating lactation in women. Methi has also been researched along with turmeric and cauliflower to prevent, eliminate 
or heal prostate cancer in men. So if you were to make gobi or cauliflower with turmeric and methi, you're actually saving your prostate forever. And I know a lot of men who have actually had plenty of cauliflower in their diets and they're well over 75, they don't even have benign prostate hyperplasia, which is um, otherwise the enlarged prostate. And it just surprises me that we have so much in our little kitchens and we just don't know, you know, it's just completely unbelievable. So the reason why I wanted to introduce this soup with all of you is that the garam masala that we've used and the tridoshik churna that we've used. Now, the commercial garam masala that you get, like in a store, okay, has plenty of uh, filler ingredients, like they put in for other spices as well. They don't really roast all of the spices separately so that the oils come out in the way that they have to, and then they don't combine them. Because I went to a manufacturing unit, I went to two of them, and I went to a third one, and the third one I said, if this is the quality of spices, we have to make our own. And so we started making our own garam masala. And I've said this before, garam masala is one of those things, it's like a family secret of a specific garam masala, right? Some families use more cinnamon in their garam masala, some people use more cayenne pepper. So in this uh, recipe that we have from our home, we use um, a lot of cardamom for cooling, we use cinnamon for warmth, we use nutmeg, we use tar anise, and uh, a few other spices and things, but these are the ones that we really focus on. So you really want to try this particular soup. Not only is it very warming to your system, it is extremely nutritious. If you get that much of tur dal in your system every day, it's really going to be good for you. Isn't it fragrant? You like the fragrance? Can you try the uh, methi leaves fresh? No, see the methi leaves fresh are not as potent as the way we dehydrate them. The way that we dehydrate them is along with ashwagandha root. And ashwagandha root, we powder it. And when it is in the Excalibur and we take it out, we put the ashwagandha root on top of it and we dry it that way. The reason for this is ashwagandha, of course, is an anti-stress herb. It's very good for virility. It's also good to uh, take care of, um, you know, some emotional imbalances. So it's a very good potent herb. So ashwagandha is highly recommended. You guys like it? Oh, he likes it. You have an Indian girlfriend, don't you? No. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> well, if the food is spicy, she could be spicy too. <laughs> Do you like it, Art? Love it. Love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. You like it? You haven't had the turdal soup like this? See, and the other thing with this turdal soup, you know, I also added a little bit of our coconut milk powder. I am a huge fan of coconut. The problem is, most people think, oh, coconut, it's high in cholesterol. That's not true at all. Coconut has got fantastic medium chain fatty acids. And it has this component called lauric acid. And lauric acid in coconut, especially in the flesh of the coconut, is very good for you. When I started uh, teaching cooking classes in the Bay Area, uh, to, of course, a lot of my patients would come and bring their families. So in our retreat center, when I commenced teaching my own cuisine classes, the first thing was, you know, where do we get coconut milk powder? At that time, we were making enough coconut milk powder for our own use. We were not selling it. And I just thought, you know, you could probably get some in cartons and all that. The same recipe, I just tried it because I really got a nasty email once <laughs> saying that it, my curry didn't taste the same as yours. I think it's in the coconut milk powder. So just to give her the benefit of the doubt, I actually got um, some coconut milk water that's available commercially in a little carton. And then I, I didn't buy the one in a can, but I bought the one in the carton, like a Tetra pack. Thank you. And I went ahead and, you know, kind of tried it. And then it was terrible, right? So I apologized to her, wrote her an email, and I said, I'll start making some for you. And I did. I, she was the first lady that we started making coconut milk powder for. 
So the way that we make our coconut milk powder is so simple. We buy the real fresh coconut by the organic ones, not the Thai coconut. And then we dehydrate them in the Excalibur. And then we take some almonds, soak them in water. Not some almonds, lots of almonds. <laughs> soak them in water, um, peel them. And uh, we have a little process for that, a little rubbing tool. Peel them, mix a little bit of the almond powder along with the center of the coconut, which is different from the coconut milk powder we had last year. Because last year we just did just the flesh of the coconut dehydrated. In this year, so we mix the almonds with the coconut milk powder. Phenomenal nutrition. The lauric acid is there. There's protein from the almonds. And then it's completely much more creamier than it was before. And if you were to just make a little roux, the way they do in French cuisine, and then add it to different Thai curries and Indian food, the taste was absolutely amazing. And also, when we dehydrate it, we have noticed that a lot of the actual so-called fat content that people are really, you know, freaked out about disappears. So when we did take it to the lab, it did not have as much fat content per serving as opposed to the, you know, the coconut milk that you get in cans. I would never recommend anything from a can. See, whenever something is canned, you have to use either something with sugar or salt to preserve it right? There is an inner lining in these cans. And sugar and salt reacts with this inner lining, which means it does affect the food that is actually in the can. So as much as possible, don't ever use anything that comes in a can. Unless you're canning it yourself in a glass bottle. You know, that's okay. You can raise your hands if you'd like some more soup. <laughs> Um, oh, you would like some more too? Uh, you didn't, they didn't get any? No? Just walked in. Oh, you just walked in. Okay. Um, you can just step into the kitchen and they'll get you some more soup. Okay. So I'm going to do one more little breathing exercise. So just sit on your chairs. Keep your feet flat on the floor. Take a deep breath in and breathe out. Breathe in again and breathe out. So you're going to breathe in with your nose and breathe out with your mouth. Okay? Okay. So if any of you know anyone who's having GERD or acidity symptoms, this is a fantastic breath right before a meal. You keep your palms facing downwards on your thighs. Breathe in. And... Fantastic. All right. So now, if you do notice that you're not able to enjoy your food or you have a tendency to eat very fast... You should do this, take your hands, raise them up in Namaste, then fold them up like so and breathe in and out very fast. And relax. If you repeat that in a cycle of nine breaths three times, you will notice that you have to eat slow. Because what we are doing is we are creating some air in your stomach, which will slowly dissipate only if you eat slow. And please eat slow. You know, when we were kids, we were always told, you should chew your food 32 times. And I was thinking, I will not have any friends left. Because all the kids wanted to chow down their food or gobble their food. So I told myself, let's come to a little bit of an understanding. Not 32 times, I'm going to chew my food 16 times, right? And I noticed that when I chewed my food 16 times, there was more salivary action happening in my mouth. Now, it's very important to understand salivary amylase. The process of digestion does not happen in your stomach. It happens in your mouth. It's when the salivary amylase works into your mouth and helps you digest your food. 
all right? So the attitude that you have towards your food is extremely important. Did they give you some more? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, they would like some more food, soup, both of them. So what is the attitude that most of you have towards your food? I would like to know because what is food to you? Food is magic. Very nice. What's food to you? When you feel hungry, you eat. What, do you, what is food to you? Nourishment. Nourishment. Very good. What did you say? Energy and light. Energy and light. What is food to you? Energy. 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 Okay. So, a lot of us do agree that food is energy. Isn't that right? Everything in life is got potential energy and kinetic energy. Sometimes potential energy... You got yours now? Did they give you more soup? Awesome. Very good. The thing with potential energy is that it can get converted to kinetic energy. Now, when you look at the energy of the food, it starts with the components, the ingredients that are used to make the dish. Okay? In this case, does it really matter where your tour dal was grown? Absolutely. Does it matter how your turmeric was dried? Absolutely. Now, I know that some people could say, oh my God, you're really getting minute. You know, sometimes you just need to forget about it. You know, it takes a lot of effort to be minute, but that effort needs to be done only once. To do all your research and get the right ingredients in line, then it's a process, correct? But until you come to that level of a process, you would be cutting corners. Cutting corners means you're creating a certain inadequacy in the amount of energy that you could actually receive in your bowl or on your plate, right? So where your food comes from, very important. How it is sourced, even more important. The person who prepares it, their state of mind, very important. The process of preparation, not helter skelter, everything done in a systematic manner, very important. Now, I did a little bit of an experiment. I made the exact same dish. I made this one dish, which is called aviol. And normally it's done with um, dairy, right? So we decided that we're going to make the non-dairy version. So I decided to make it once with complete helter skelter, you know, creating chaos in my kitchen and preparing this dish. I didn't tell anybody anything because I was observing. I noticed that when I served that dish, which was prepared in a haphazard, helter-skelter manner, of course I didn't compromise on the taste, but I made sure that it was all disheveled, it was all over the place. All the people who <coughs> ate it, when I observed them, right after, three, four hours later we meditated, nobody had a deep meditation. All right? I prepared the same dish for my next meditation class. Same set of people. I prepared this dish in an absolutely calm thing. I did my own personal program. Everything was very orderly and I prepared the dish. Everyone had a very profound, deep experience. Now, if that's true of something like meditation, can you imagine what could happen on a day-to-day -day basis in your homes? How your attitude towards food and the preparation of it and how the attitude of the person who actually consumes the food you make, how much of a significant improvement can you really have in their lives just by preparing food when you are in a good mood, in a good temperament, when you're just happy? That's really something to think about. So I'm going to open the floor out to some questions about spices. I'm open to answering any questions about spices, where they come from, what they do, and how it needs to be stored and things like that. So if you have any questions, please feel free to answer, ask them. Uh, what's the, uh, what spice makes this hot? Oh yes, it has a little bit of cayenne in it. Cayenne. Uh, and the cayenne, it has 90,000 IU. It's for the heat units because we're just moving into the cooler time of the year. And it's very good not just for the metabolism, but it's very good for the circulation. Yeah. Yes. We are in the three different categories of people. Vata, pita and kapha. What makes this okay for everybody? Very good question. I knew you'd ask me 
Good questions. Okay. So what really makes this good for all categories is incorporating the Tridoshic Churna. The Tridoshic Churna is a very balancing Churna. You bought some last time. It's the salt, different spice churna. It can be put on anything from salads to soups, and it balances out for all groups of people. And many people use it in layer of salt because it's just like a flavored salt, but very flavored, very herby salt. Yes. Yeah, um, is one of my favorites. One of my favorites too. I actually call it cardamom. <laughs> yes. Okay, so there are two types of cardamom that I use in my cooking. I use black cardamom and green cardamom. Um, the black cardamom, I use it very sporadically. I use it only when I make very curry dishes, um, like biryanis or very heavy dishes. Uh, when I make the light, flavorful, playful dishes, as I call it, I always use the green cardamom. Um, the cardamom, I don't ever buy it in powder form. Uh, I get it from an estate source in Kerala from southwestern India. It's normally used as a secondary crop to a rubber plantation. It's, it grows in the shade of a rubber pl plantation. And uh, when they harvest it, it's really the pods that come from the root. And they dry it. And then you take the seeds out. You should always store the seeds as opposed to storing the pods. When you store the seeds, you always store them in a glass container in a place, in a cool, dark place, and you grind some only when you want to use it. It's always a good idea to use a coffee grinder, which is in stainless steel, because the blades will be sharp enough, because it's used for the coffee bean. Um, I don't drink coffee, never have, and I use a coffee grinder or a drill machine, which I have, for grinding cardamom. And cardamom is a very cooling spice. It's normally used um, late spring, and right through summer, early summer, sometimes even early fall, you know, like the type of heat wave we had last week. So it's like that. So um, I think cardamom is a fantastic spice. It's very good for many savory dishes, but it's even better for sweet dishes because it has an inherent uh, faint licorice accent about it. So it's very beautiful. Yeah. So you store it in the pod? I, I store it out of the pod in a glass container in a cool, dry place. Yes. Okay, it's a very good question. So um, I get asked this question often, right? Because um, even though I'm from India, I've spent most of my life all over the world. And I don't make only Indian food. Um, what I really make is to be able to put Ayurvedic principles and holistic understanding and integrative comprehension of nutritive values into cuisine from all over the world. So I do something called Om Cuisine, which is authentic, universal, meditative. And I cook from 19 different places all over the world, which has a cuisine that is worthy to be spoken about, right? So not all countries, unfortunately, have that. And you're very right. When you live in a modern scenario, there is a chance that plenty of toxicity can infiltrate not just in your food by way of how it's grown or genetic modification or inorganic substances, but also the air that you breathe and emotions that you go through, relationships that you have. And I really think that five things help healing the process. It's not just food. First of all, to be able to sleep well, a person needs to eat well. And a person, in order to eat well, needs to be in a good state of mind. In order to be in a good state of mind, you have to have a, a job that you love. And in order to have a job that you love, you need to be in a place where you go with your intuition. Some of the most beautiful people I know in my life are not highly educated, but they were in the right place at the right time to be hired by the right people and made a career and a life out of something that they tremendously enjoy doing. 
I know some of them who are Apple engineers. They love building Apple computers, right? They love it. That's what they would rather do than even eat. And a computer that comes out of a place like that has to be good, right? It's like that. So to answer your question, it's very important to not live in a state of chaos. Never have too much clutter around you. If you have clutter around you, your quality of sleep is going to be affected. Your focus will be affected. Your clarity of mind will be affected. When you focus on your kitchen, make sure that you organize everything in a very systematic manner so that you seek the pleasure in making your food. And, you know, holding on to food as if it was an extension of your own body. Even Hippocrates said, you know, let food be thy medicine. Food has always been our medicine in, as far as Ayurvedic medicine is concerned. When I decided to explore the concept of integrative nutrition and holistic cuisine and integrative health and medicine, the first thing that was really glaring at my face is how people don't realize, they believe, they probably think that they're going to get more than one body. They are not. So to get some very uh, blatant brass tack facts, <laughs> facts very clear, like you will have just one body, it is a good idea to get energy, all the good kinds, into your food. If anybody even remotely talks negatively on your dining table, do not answer to, you know, kind of instigate that negativity. Just turn the conversation around, make it positive. All of these things reduce toxicity surprisingly more than eating something which, which is genetically modified. It is the aura that comes out of food and the aura that comes out of a person. Right? Sometimes water, which is the most murky and dirty, like from the Ganges, just because of the vibrations around it, is considered one of the purest waters in the world. I was recently in Kailash and Manasarovar. The Manasarovar water, my goodness. I mean, I don't know what all happens in the banks of that lake. But surprisingly, it has absolute curative properties, which I have seen with my own eyes. I was a person of science until I realized that the wonderful thing about miracles is that they happen every day. And I think sometimes in our lives, the toxicity that we are really seeing and feeling is what happens with the heart and the mind and the dialogue between them. You know, So even though you can pay attention to, oh, I will eat this kind of a diet, that type of a vegetable, if you're feeling sick in your head or horrible in your heart, it doesn't matter what you eat. You know, so food takes on the value of the person who is actually taking it. Sometimes the food which is dried and not so flavorful can become nutrition for a human being because they've been deprived of food, right? Similarly, for a person who's been into gastronomic indulgences, the most curative food can be absolute poison. Anything can happen. So in this case, one thing that we can be very consistent about is our state of the mind and the clarity that it has and the unconditional love that our heart can give. When people ask me, you travel so much, where is your home? I have a technical home, but that's just my technical home. It features on my driver's license. That's it. I believe the world is my home and I genuinely feel that. I wouldn't have told you that when I was 20 years old, but now I feel that the world is my home. And the reason why I feel the world is my home is that there are mothers everywhere. There is healing food everywhere. It's just about tapping into the right synergy of it. And the entire world, in my opinion, was reincarnated in groups. That means whenever you have a little bit of negativity, you have four people who are positive. So the point is, are we really going to focus on the negative person? Or are we going to enjoy the positive energy of the four of them? It's a very simple example, right? Whenever somebody says, I love you, you always ask how much. But when a person says, I hate you, do you ever ask how much? No. Maybe we should try, right? <laughs> Beautiful question. Thank you for allowing me to share. Yes, any more questions about spices and mices? Yeah. Yes. That's a very good question. Spices and seasons are a fantastic question. Remember, if a spice looks tender, it's meant for spring and summer. And if a spice looks really sturdy 
and wanting to give you a punch of flavor. It's always meant for the winter. Um, think of something very simple. If I was to make a fennel salad, it's a cooling spice, and make the actual fennel salad, it has enough sweetness coming out of it, I'd probably make a dressing with some tahini and cardamom and just a teeny weeny bit of black pepper for the spring. But why am I putting the black pepper? Because we have the lurking mucus from the season gone by. All right? Um, we should connect offline because I have a very interesting course coming up just about this. So we should connect. And then I'm just going to give a really short answer because we really don't have the time to go deep into it because I love that topic. And um, when you look at cardamom, the reason why we call it a cooling spice is that it can actually reduce the temperature of your body. Um, a drink that I advise often in um, the um, summer months is I incorporate some cucumber, pulverize it with cilantro or parsley in tender coconut water with cardamom. It's a very cooling drink because any, everything you put into that is a cooling thing, right? So um, I don't believe in air conditioning or heaters and, um, you know, fans are great, but no air conditioning, no heaters. I, I, we do have something with some solar panels or something in the house, but those are okay, I think. I just don't like the concept of, you know, even if you clean all these things, there could be something there. I just don't really want to spoil the natural habitat of something that wants to live you know, on free rent, of course. And um, so I was just looking at what are the beverages that I can really have right through summer that will not make me feel so hot. And sometimes I have two summers in a year. I go to the Southern Hemisphere right after our Northern Hemisphere summer. So I have plenty of summer. And in India, it's hot all the time. I mean, when people say it's kind of nice in India, I'm like, really, where do you get your stash from, right? It's just extremely hot. So it is very important to start looking into foods, not just spices, that are cooling for that season if it is summer and warming if it's winter. And very inherently and by um, experiments as well as influence from different cultures, we've all been doing that. That's why our pecan pies have cinnamon in it. That's why our Christmas cakes have nutmeg in it, because they're warming spices. You know, so our minestrone soups, yes, they do have cayenne pepper. They do have cloves. Yeah. Yes? What are we going to do in a situation like a Monsanto that's really moving real quick to contaminate or take away all of this nutrition that we need? Oh, Monsanto is such a, I don't know what to say. It's like, uh, it's like seeing the devil eye to eye. <laughs> um, I, um, I have a huge issue uh, not just with the company, uh, not just with the people who run it, but people who voluntarily give wrong information and believe that people should not know about this, okay? But the thing is, everybody knows, and most people who are the decision makers look the other way. That is an unfortunate circumstance. Um, I would recommend uh, starting to grow your own food, which is what we all do. We do a lot of permaculture. And we do a lot of microclimates uh, because we don't have extensive lands, but we're able to make enough food, which is good enough for, you know, our retreats, our center, as well as maybe some neighbors and people start sharing. Um, is it something I'm super concerned about? 100%. There is no doubt about it because you're right. They are moving very fast. They're not just moving very fast by themselves. They have a lot of uh, political support to do this. And um, it is a horrendous thing. It is going to kill our children and create disease in the brains of people. And we need to stop them. And I don't know what level of advocacy can actually um, penetrate into their thick skulls to make that happen. But I think, um, I know somebody who is doing it and she's done a fantastic signature campaign, but I think it should not stop with signature campaigns, you know? It should continue on to something on the grassroots levels on how much with scientific evidence it is really affecting our children. It will affect our children, it will affect our children's children. And soon we will have children born like cyclops, you know, we will have third eyes, but not in the spiritual sense, but because of a genetic modification. We will have it. And the amount of children I see with cancer as patients is heart-wrenching. It just cannot be. I mean, for no fault of theirs at all, 
You know, they have, um, you know, some children who are born in wonderful homes and have the best of nutrition, so they think, um, you know, get leukemia when they are like five months old. Some of the, that's the youngest patient I've seen, five months, leukemia. And, or slightly older, like three and a half years old, lymphomas, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, terrible. Usually Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's usually affect um, children between the age of 16 to 24. Children will, uh, 16 to 24. But now, the earliest cases that we see are something like five and six. So, it, that's bad karma. Yes, okay. <laughs> but we can talk about it, you know. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move um, the questions on to, any more questions on spices? Yes. I was curious, um, I've always heard turmeric with regards to people that have cancer. Yes. Or, you know, uh -huh. What's your opinion on that? Oh, we just spoke about it, actually. You didn't come to the beginning part of the lecture. But that's okay, I'll tell you again. So the thing though with turmeric is that it's a natural antiviral, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. But the thing is the component of curcumin, which is in the turmeric, is um, shown fantastic results for um, cancer-related issues, especially when, you know, cancer usually from the breast metastasizes to um, the lungs or the blood for women. In, in the case of, um, you know, using turmeric in your diet, that will not happen. Um, similarly, turmeric is very good to treat leukemia, different forms of lymphoma, multiple myeloma, melanomas, different types of cancer. It's also very good for um, Alzheimer's, the prevention and the treatment of Alzheimer's. Thank you. You're most welcome. And, and, yeah. I mean, just getting turmeric, excuse me, but just getting it like at Rainbow Grocery or something? I don't know about where Rainbow gets it from, but I hope it's, in a, it's a good source. Um, the, the turmeric we get it from is from Kerala, and you should stop by our booth sometime. We'll tell you more about it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, saffron is the um, stamen of the crocus sativus plant, and um, saffron is considered the the spices of the maharajas or the emperors and the empresses. And the thing with saffron is that it's a very warming, it's a very heating spice. And what happens with a warming and a heating spice is that it really enhances circulation. And it is also very good to purify the blood. So normally, if you look at a spice, it is what it can do for you. When you look at turmeric, it looks very sacred, so it can clean. When you look at the stamen of a crocus, the tivus plant, it's a saffron, it's red in color, it looks like the arteries of your body. So it can do just that. If you look at a walnut, it looks like a brain. It's good for your brain. So most of the things that you eat and see, it's more about how the, you can see and tell the story, you know? So saffron, again, is a very warming thing. I wouldn't recommend it too much in the summer, but it's a very good thing to be used in fall, late fall, winter, even up to early spring, but not in the summer. Yes? I know you live in San Jose, but you also live in about 19 other countries. <laughs> uh, no, not anymore. Not 19 countries. Only uh, 11 countries. Oh, okay. <laughs> so in, a, in a month, will be 11 countries. In a month, usually, between 9 and 11 countries, yeah. Well, I'm concerned about where we can actually get spices that we can trust. Spices are so, were so important to me. I understand, of course. Trans transitioning from the meat diet to the, to the vegan diet. Uh, without the spices, I would never have made it. But to get reliable spices, especially the turmeric. Uh, you can actually um, just come by to our booth and we will figure out a way in which we'll get you on our mailing list and we can actually mail it to you. It's um, very easy to do and we can... Well, that's what I was going to ask. If you could get a, get a little business going. <laughs> I will see about that. I don't know. But, you know, we, people are really, like, busy doing other stuff. But, you know, I think, especially turmeric, I get requests from all over the world now because they notice the difference when they have our turmeric versus the other turmeric because they're like, the other thing is not even turmeric, you know. So this is definitely a better quality. Come by and we'll figure out a way. Someone asked me recently, we sent an order nine kilos of turmeric. I was like, are you going to bathe in it? Like, really? What is going to happen? <laughs> but they were like, yeah, you know, it's uh, turmeric and I, we're just going to give it to all our cousins and all our relatives. So they gave that away as Christmas presents and stockings. 
So the same people have ordered turmeric again this time and then recently they put in an order for cinnamon. And I said, oh wow, this is such a good idea. And what she wants to do is put it into a little uh, plastic bag. She'll put them into a cloth bag and she'll tie it up with a little tassel and have two cinnamon sticks like that. I thought, wow, it's such a good idea. I think we can have Lakshmi or Matthew be in charge. Um, and I will give you our email address. It's ayurvedaforlife at yahoo.com. A-Y-U-R-V-E-D-A. F-O-R-L-I-F-E at yahoo.com. A-Y-U-R-V-E-D-A F-O-R-L-I-F-E Ayurveda for Life at Yahoo. Thank you. No, that's a very important you know, thing. I can, you know, spices are so important, like the little taste, the nuances of it makes a big difference. Yes, okay. You had a question? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, if I could introduce a question about lime with the spice. No, kind of I've been finding more and more that using lime in various situations is very inviting. It, I know it goes to the heart channel. Yes, it does. It goes into the Anahata Chakra. Like cilantro does. And so sometimes combined in this Very good question. So let me talk a little bit about it. So we have seven chakras. The uh, bottommost chakra is called the muladhara or the base chakra, the root chakra. And as we go along, we have a buffer chakra right here. And the buffer chakra is the anahata chakra. And the anahata chakra is responsible for unconditional love. Now, un unconditional love which you receive and give, right? So there's a two-way street. And for that, there is a certain quality of spice or herb that lightens it up. Okay, so every day in my life, I incorporate five things in the foods that I eat. I eat turmeric, I have cilantro or mint, then I use cumin or tridoshic churna, I use cinnamon if it is the warm weather or cardamom if it is the cool weather, and I use a lemon or lime based on whether it is morning or evening. Now, when you are cooking in the morning, right up to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you should use lemons. So the way to remember it is L-E-M-O-N, M-O-N for morning, <laughs> so lemon. After 3 o'clock, you will use limes. So E, evening, lime. So that's the way to remember. So this particular drink that you had with the tridoshic churna and the cumin has lemon in it, not lime, lemon. And lemon is one of the few things which is known to be acidic, but it's not, and it's alkaline to the body. It's very cleansing to the body. So whenever you want to drink hot water, right after a meal, or just sip it through, you want to ask for hot water with lemon. What is interesting is from time immemorial, people have always focused on the importance of having alkalinity in their diet as opposed to their bodies being acidic. Now, if your body is alkaline, which means the pH balance is 7 or higher, more the alkalinity, the healthier your body is, and lesser than 7 would make your body acidic. Now, whenever your body is acidic, the problem is that a lot of different bad things can happen in your body. For example, if you have a chance with some cancerous cells lurking around, if your body is acidic for more than 2 or 3 days, it can manifest itself into cancer. However, if your alkalinity is high, these cancerous cells don't stand a chance. So it is very important to incorporate lemon. Now, I think one part of your question is, how do you incorporate lemon or lime with specific spices, which will enhance your heart chakra? Is that your question? Well, you, you're giving it a definition and a direction, but uh, mine was based on the fact that it, it, it enhances Yes, it does. Vegetable it brings it together. Okay. So, okay. So the thing, though, with lemon is that I sometimes look at lemons and I go like, hmm, what else can I do with this today? So I do a lot of things with lemons. I use the lemon rind when I bake, when I make gluten-free muffins. I use um, lemons in my water all the time. 
I think lemons combined with a lot of the savory spices add a tang and a punch and a very savory feel to curries especially. But you shouldn't cook with lemons on the stove too much because that will automatically create a certain bitterness to the other things which are present in the food and then that's not very conducive. Lemons are normally added after you take your food away from the fire. However, lemons are some things which can integrate very, very seamlessly in your salads. I also use lemons for my scalp. It prevents uh, me from having any issues with my scalp, especially after a long journey. Um, I you know, use lemons and perhaps some parsley and with warm olive oil for my scalp and it really helps with luxurious hair growth. And lemons are also fantastic for the face as an astringent. Lemons are very good for your skin because it prevents you from getting wrinkles. So I think it's just a very versatile little thing, you know. I mean, that's why it's such a big deal in Southeast Asia. You always have a lemon tree outside your house. <laughs> so lemons are really good, yeah. It's a very good observation, actually, because I've noticed also that people who use plenty of lemons in their cooking um, the children never fall sick in the household at all, you know, and um, their teeth is much better. I mean, like uh, Art always used to say, the reason why the, uh, you know, the sailors were called, British sailors were called limeys, is because they used to suck on lemons or limes to prevent scurvy, right, to prevent the bleeding of the gums. So that's why the soldiers are called, you know, limeys. All right, so can we move on to the next spectrum of our conversation? All right, yes. Um, just quickly, was that olive oil and lemon, and what was the other? Parsley, was it? Parsley. Or they, you, you for, your, for the hair. Massage, massage yeah, I use it for a massage oil, especially after a long flight. Because see, what happens during a long flight is that most people get a vata imbalance, which is an air imbalance. So it's really important to soothe your scalp. And when you soothe your scalp, the only way to do it is that you need something that warms so that it nourishes the root, and that's what olive oil does. You need parsley because it purifies, and or you can use tea tree oil, but it's just too much, you know, so I use parsley. And lemon, which is an astringent, it removes all of the debris of the product that you've used. So it's really a good thing. And, you know, the thing with um, a lot of lemons and... Um, olive oil in general, is that it gives you the right amount of moisture and the right amount of stripping agents without really affecting the quality of the shaft of your hair. So that's a good combination. Thank you. Yes, any other questions? About spices? Okay, good, great. So I want to talk a little bit about your attitude towards food. You know, when all of you were saying, many of you said energy, and that was really good to listen to. But, you know, some people said, I'm hungry, so I eat. That is not uh, the right attitude towards food. You should approach food as something that strums the guitar when you sing a song for your soul. You know? And food, if it has to strum the guitar, and you're singing in, in like a D minor, and it's strumming at a G major, there's a problem there. The song is going to sound like noise, right? You want to be able to eat intuitively, but in order to eat intuitively, you should embrace a meditative practice. A meditative practice which is not driven by taste or timing, but driven by flavor, intensity, and nutrition. And flavor that is driven by intensity and nutrition only happens when your mind is clear and your heart is open. You could have resources that help you get the best food in the world, but what will really be the problem? I'll give you an example, okay? I went to eat in this really, really fancy restaurant. Someone um, treated me for um, something that I did, and um, it's this place called French Laundry, and it's in Yonsville. It's one of those places where you make reservations six months in advance. The hype was worth it, that I must say. It's really good food. <laughs> the hype was super worth it. But there was a couple that was sitting right beside my very gregarious group. <laughs> my group was filled with like 
obnoxiously loud, fantastic people who didn't really belong in a French stiff upper lipped British kind of vegan restaurant. We believe we really belonged like in a cafe, you know, yodeling away. But we were having a whale of a time. And I could see that most of the tables around me, the people who were seated there were so jealous. Then I realized jealousy is indeed admiration in war paint. They wanted to be in our table, but they couldn't. They had no reservations six months ago or ever. So I saw this really beautifully coiffed woman with her hair done just perfectly and her nails, which didn't even have a tad of a chip in the nail polish. Or I'm wondering, like, who does your dishes, really? Like, <laughs> and then, you know, she had the lipstick just on perfectly, not even a little bit of smudge here and there. And she was dressed so well. The man was in a suit, and apparently they were celebrating something. They didn't speak a single word to each other. I was wondering, what are they celebrating? The death of their marriage? Really, it was, didn't seem like an anniversary or anything romantic, even a tad. There was not one discussion. He just said, I'd like more red wine. That's it. <laughs> I, I was observing him so intently. And then in the far corner, there was this other couple that was dining. And um, this woman was yada, 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 yada. Right? And the man was trying to be centered and eating in the Vedic style. She was interfering with his experience and her own because she didn't really care. And the other woman was complaining about the food. What kind of portions are these? I was thinking, you know what? Go to Burger King. You're in the wrong place. <laughs> you know, seriously. And it's things like that. So, and there was this other couple that I thought if they cracked a smile, their teeth would fall out, you know? <laughs> really bad. It was like, mm. and I, the food was really good. Seriously, they could have enjoyed it a little better. But my whole thing is that, you know, the person you eat with is very important. My great grandmother was a very wise woman, as in all the women in my family up to me. Okay. <laughs> I still have some time to gain some wisdom. <laughs> so my great grandmother is such a hilarious woman. She passed away at 108. Okay, I know, magical number. Mm. I think she left her body rather than dying. And she used to say something which was so beautiful. She said that she had never eaten a single meal in her life with somebody she had hatred towards. Not one meal. And she said, that is the biggest secret. She was interviewed by like these top newspapers and all. It was a big deal to live to that age, I believe. So, um, And her father was a postman who fell in love with a doctor in those days. Oh. We've had love in our family for years. <laughs> and it's like major love story, right? And because the father was a postman, we had access to the birth certificate, which is a big deal in those days. And um, she said she's not had a single meal with somebody she's ever had hatred towards in her life. And I think she was interviewed when she was about 95, and they asked her, how much longer will you live? And she said, as long as I want to. And I really wish that all of us could say that, you know, it's just a little punch there. And also the other thing that she used to say is that she's never cooked for anybody that she didn't like. She said, I wouldn't cook just because they came to my house. No way. She said, maybe it's the Indian thing to do, but I'm sorry. I don't cook for people I don't like. And the thing is, I asked her, so who is it that you don't like? She said, usually people I didn't like never came home. And I said, what if there was a group of people, you know, I would ask her a lot of questions because, you know, and once she just cut me off and she said, a fool can ask more questions than an intelligent person can answer. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's true. But I still had questions <laughs> because, you know, you learn from people who are wise by not what they say, but by observing them, by their habits and the stories they have to tell and the love that they have to speak. And... The loving way in which she could even cut a vegetable. She cut her own vegetables on the last day, you know, and she helped us all prepare food. And it was just a joyous experience. And I think back of this cherubic woman who was four feet negligible in height that could make a man quiver from 100 meters away. <laughs> without a problem. Because beyond 100 meters, I think she had an eyesight problem towards the end of her life. She would, used to be like, mm, it's you. What are you doing with the other woman when you have a wife? You know, she'd be like that. She's a very, 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 you know, intuitive person. Absolutely gorgeous. So um, 
The other thing that she said, which was wonderful towards the attitude of food, she said, always give thanks before you eat. Now, every culture in the world gives thanks. You know, there are prayers from all over the world about giving thanks towards food. Because only then can food nourish. And there is a huge emphasis on that. It's very important. All right. Next question. All right, great. So I'm going to teach you guys just one more thing. Take your right palm and place it in the center of your heart chakra. Okay, so your heart chakra is really in the V that is formed by your rib cage, all right? So it's right here. And you're not holding it like this, but it's like very nice. Okay, keep your eyes closed and we'll chant Om three times. Take a deep breath in. Om. Breathe in again. Om. Breathe in again. Continue to keep your heart beating very gently. Don't move your palm to words where your heart really is, but just feel your heartbeat very gently. Every day before you commence a meal, Focus on one organ in your body. Several times in our life, perhaps even every day, we go through the day without giving gratitude for our bodies, which are really the receiving end of the food that we put into it. The purpose of nourishment, the process of assimilation, and the love of the hands of the gardener, the chef, or the person you love who made the food for you. As you focus every day on one of your organs, remember that from your next meal, what you would have is not just the completion of a meal, you would have the beginning of a journey of a relationship with each of these organs in order to make sure that you have an inherent glow. Which will create that ojus or tejas, the glow from within, becoming part of your personality and your appearance so effortlessly. Slowly and gently open your eyes. Hmm. So, um, I will be at the booth um, now for about maybe an, about an hour, okay? So if you have any questions while you see the spices, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And if you have any queries about specific recipes and or you would like to be on our mailing list, please go ahead and write your information there and we'll be in touch with you. If you're interested in cooking classes, make sure you put that within parenthesis. And we plan to do a whole series of cooking classes in San Francisco area. Um, we're going to be doing six classes in the San Francisco area, six in the peninsula, and 12 in the South Bay in the coming three months. So it'll be lovely to see some of these faces again, because obviously you guys are interested in food. Otherwise, you won't be spending a weekend here, right? Or in vegetarianism, of course. Um, so before I close, if you have any questions about Ayurveda per se, or any queries about... Um, the type of integrative medicine we practice, I'd be more than happy to answer them.
Yes. You're going to be here all day tomorrow. Right? I'll be all day tomorrow, but not today because I'm uh, leading the meditation in a yoga mob in Las Gatos this evening. So, yes. Okay. So, no questions? Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure. I'm sorry? Of course.